I now call our final speaker of the night, the Right Honourable the Lord Campbell of Pittenween, Companion of Honour, Commanding Officer of the Order of the British Empire, Privy Councillor, Queen's Council and Knight Bachelor. He was the leader of the Liberal Democrats between 2005 and 2007. He's a former Olympic sprinter, one time styled as the fastest white man on the planet. He moved into the law and then politics. Lord Campbell, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I'm only sorry that you didn't describe me as, a, as a, an attractive and enjoyable dinner companion. <laughs> <laughs> it would have made my day. Um, I'm going to begin with two admissions. First of all, the decision has been made and we will leave. And the question now is the conditions under which we will leave. And I don't, particularly today, when a statement was made in the House of Commons and repeated in the House of Lords, I have no confidence that this government is willing to enter into an agreement which will be acceptable to the European Union and that we will leave essentially relying on WTO rules. The other admission I want to make is that I'm not a scholar, I'm a politician. And to pick up on a couple of points made very recently, it's quite true that the hawk-faced men went down from Brussels to Athens and they told the Greeks what they had to do. And they did it, the Greeks, and they survived. And if the hawk-faced men hadn't gone and said what they did, then there's a very good chance that the Greek economy would have become bankrupt. The second point is the point about NATO. Uh, let's be clear, whatever people may now seek to argue, the European movement, the small m, was always as much political as it was economic. And it's quite true that NATO has had an enormous significance in the defense of Europe. But that NATO was always a political movement as well. And therefore, you never heard me or any responsible person on the argument for Remain uh, trying to suggest that it was the European Union on its own, on its own alone and single-handed, that had helped to preserve peace in the continent. For the fortnight before I was born, my mother spent every night in an air raid shelter in the west end of Glasgow, while the Luftwaffe tried to destroy the shipyards of the Clyde. And I grew up in a, in a city with holes, holes where there had been buildings and holes where people had died. And it wasn't all one-way traffic. We have just had drawn to our attention that we've just passed the 75th anniversary of the firestorm and charnel house created by British and American bombers in Dresden when thousands were killed in unimaginable terror and bloodshed. And there are those who question both the motives and the objectives of that quite extraordinary piece of behavior in the Second World War. Is it any surprise that out of that came the determination that these things should never happen again, if at all possible. Why did they start with coal and steel? They started because you had to mine the coal in order to fire the furnaces to make the steel to rebuild the continent of Europe. But it was always political, and necessarily so. There is no such thing, in spite of the American Constitution, there is no such thing as a perfect union. The EU is not a perfect union. The United Kingdom is not a perfect union. Were it so, then the Scottish National Party would not have 45 out of the 59 seats in Scotland. That's a reflection of the extent to which the people of Scotland do not think that they are in a perfect union. But it's quite right, as Gisela Stewart said, in unions you get strength, you get influence, and you get security. 
And that is what we will lose by leaving the European Union, which, as I've said already, as my preface, we must now accept is going to happen. And before I leave the question of the history, let me just say this. Britain had all the chance in the world to be the leader of the European Union. Winston Churchill is sometimes quoted as having been in favour of the creation of the Union, but in truth he was ambivalent. But when the first conference was held in advance of the Treaty of Rome, Britain didn't send a minister, it sent a civil servant. We turned down an opportunity that EU could have been moulded in the kind of way which we would have found most com comfortable. And I want you to consider this contradiction. This government now says, and it was echoed this evening, we want a close, cooperative relationship with the European Union. But by leaving it, we have weakened it. We have weakened ourselves, and we have weakened the very union with which we wish to be so close. And I'll tell you something else. We have caused great anxiety and distress from those countries in the European Union with whom we have been closest allied. Like, for example, the Baltic States, Holland, Sweden, countries of that kind, Denmark, which look to us to provide a counterbalance to Germany and France. And so we leave behind a lot of people who are not just concerned about economics, but they're concerned about politics. And I want to come on to the political element that we should not ignore in this debate. We had that statement today that I referred to in both houses. The word sovereignty appeared 11 times. The only thing that was missing was a chorus of Britannia Rules the Waves or Land of Hope and Glory by Edward Elgar. But in the real world, we are now a medium-sized power. We're a medium-sized economic power. And what should medium-sized economic powers be willing to do to ensure their survival and their advance, it is to pool sovereignty. And that's what NATO is. NATO is a pooling of sovereignty. Tonight, the United Kingdom nuclear deterrent is assigned to NATO. We are permanent members of the Security Council of the United Nations. We have accepted the Charter of the United Nations, which gives us rights but imposes obligations on us. We have pooled our sovereignty in the United Nations. And that's how medium ranking powers, economic and political, are able to sustain themselves. And I hinted a moment or two ago about wanting to talk about politics. I'm sure as hell I want to talk about politics. And I want to talk about these politics. It's this. It's not just, you know, those of you who studied American politics will know that the uh, crushing slogan uh, of Clinton's victory over George Bush Sr. was, it, it's about the economy, Stuart. Well, it's not just about the economy, Europe. Because we now find ourselves in as disordered an international world as we have seen for a very long time. In the White House, you've got a narcissist, unreliable, America first, uh, a, a man who doesn't know today what he said yesterday, and a man perhaps most alarmingly who has just given his endorsement to a so-called peace settlement in the Middle East which would deny the Palestinians their right to a two-state solution. A man who, without qualm, moved the American embassy to Jerusalem, knowing, as he must, that that drove a horse and cart through the willingness of the Palestinians to agree to anything uh, which, even on the face of it, appeared to be a two-state solution. And now we have China. This is an expansionist China. An expansionist China. Have you noticed just how little we've said about Hong Kong? Why have we said a little about Hong Kong? Because of Chinese investment in this country. God help us, they want to do HS2 as the most recent thing. So where is our independence? Where is the 
influence that we would have, or we would continue to have, as part of a union of 20, 20, 28 countries. This is a China that's got political objectives, got geographical objectives. Do you think it will not recover from the problems of the virus? Of course it will. So, in our closest ally, you have someone with whom it is difficult to rely. And in China, you have a burgeoning ambition. And let's ask ourselves about Russia. Mr. Putin is increasingly powerful. He increases his own power every time he gets his hand on a constitutional settlement. He's still destabilizing, destabilizing the Ukraine. He's th still threatening Baltic states. He's put nuclear capable missiles into Kaliningrad. That's the Russian enclave in the Baltics. Uh, we know that with his uh, enthusiasm, cyber attacks were carried out in relation to the American elections, and almost certainly in relation to our um, referendum, and almost certainly, uh, more likely, on any occasion in the future in which Russia thinks it's its interest, in that world, in that unsteady world, where the rules-based system is simply being cast aside, tell me this, does it make sense? Is it the time to detach ourselves from the most successful economic and political union in history? It isn't, but we're going to do it. And we will find ourselves, I fear we will find ourselves, as caught between two superpowers without the protection of the membership of the European Union. Go back to Putin. Putin's got two objectives. One is to destabilize NATO. <laughs> Trump's done his best on that, I can tell you, over the last two or three years. Or to undermine the European Union. Well, we've undermined the European Union by leaving. Of that, there's absolutely no question. We will rely upon the good nature of Mr. Trump when it comes to a trade agreement. It's going to be the best trade agreement ever, if you believe him and Boris Johnson. It's a man, though, that who, before he goes to sleep at night, reminds himself, America first. He regards the European Union as an enemy. Why is that? Because he cannot bully it. Just as he bullies Mexico and threatens to bully Canada, he will seek to bully the United Kingdom. We haven't talked much about immigration this evening. I just want to ask two questions and leave them hanging. Is it morally right that we will only take in the doctors, the PhDs, the scientists, the rich who want to come to this country? That we will have no enthusiasm for coming, taking in the people who staff catering establishments, the care homes, that somehow we must define skills by academic and financial achievement only. i just leave these questions with you. My, I know what my answer is. I'd be interested to know what yours is. And I want to talk, if I may, in the time available, about the United Kingdom. I have two things that have been cornerstones of my political life. Scotland and the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom and the European Union. And there's absolutely no doubt that the case for independence in Scotland has been made extraordinarily stronger, not only by the Brexit vote, but by the way in which the present government uh, has sought to implement its opportunity. I was born in the west of Scotland, as I've told you. Uh, the Conservatives always used to call themselves Unionists in the west of Scotland. Anyone who knows anything about the politics of the west of Scotland will know that that is simply sectarianism by another expression. But the point is this, that the wind behind the independence campaign has been heavily supported by the activities of this government. And what about Ireland? Boris Johnson did a deal making the concession 
in relation to Ireland, Northern Ireland, that he refused to allow Theresa May to make. Now, doesn't that tell you as much about him as you need to know? He's achieved something quite remarkable. He's brought together Sinn Féin and the DUP because they're both opposed to that arrangement. And he won't answer the question, nor, would, nor will his ministers. They won't answer the question whether if you want to take goods from Northern Ireland to Scotland or to any other part of the United Kingdom, will there be some kind of customs regulation? He says no. They hedge their bets by saying, oh, it will be very light touch. Well, so, so, so their fears, their anxieties, will simply be reinforced by the reality of what happens. I'm encouraged to wind up. I want to say this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the decision, but I'll tell you who I'm really sorry for. I'm sorry for the generations here. It won't really affect my life, unless someone's found the, long, <laughs> the longevity pill, which I doubt very much. But your generation, and the generations yet to come, will not enjoy the freedoms and opportunities which membership of the European Union gave. Freedom of movement, move about, start a business. You may not even be able to take advantage of Erasmus, that extraordinary arrangement which allows people from one European country to go and study in another. The government's response to it has been, to put it mildly, equivocal. Well, who's done that? The adults have done it. The grown-ups have done it. They've taken away these freedoms and these opportunities from you, and that's why I'm sorry. They should be ashamed of themselves. And they should be ashamed of themselves for this reason. They dream of an England which is long gone, and a United Kingdom which can never be. Mr. President, arrest my case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lord Campbell, for that fine speech. I would like to give some thank yous. A thank you first to our speakers tonight, whether students or statesmen and women, they've all given remarkable speeches. I'd like to encourage you to come to some of our events over the coming days. Tomorrow we are hosting JPEG Mafia, and on Sunday there'll be a chance to read the papers and have pastries upstairs in the Kennedy Room. Next week we will be debating whether it's too late to stop climate change. But tonight in this house we will vote with our feet. As you leave this chamber, please walk through the lobby that best represents your preference. If you agree with the motion, vote aye. If you do not, vote no. If you remain undecided, please abstain. The results will be announced shortly, along with the swing in the bar. But before you leave, could I please make one final plea tonight? Brexit or remain, aye or no, in this debate, we were all united by engaging with each other. If you remain angry, don't leave here with your argument unfinished. Go into the bar. <laughs> Find an adversary. Keep at it. This union was founded as a product of debates that got out of hand in a pub. I urge you to continue that tradition tonight. Thank you.